The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Connie McLaughlin and Andy Miracle from the MUI office at the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on provider analysis. Um, it's been a pretty exciting week to be in Ohio, obviously. We've got the big um, NBA champs there um, in Cleveland, the Cavs, so we're pretty excited about that. We also celebrated Father's Day. And then to top it off, we have this analysis webinar. So I know good things are happening in Ohio this week. So we really want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, we have quite a few people um, involved in this webinar today, and so we really appreciate your time. We know you work very hard, and uh, you have a lot of things competing for your attention, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, participate in today's webinar. Um, for those that have not been involved in our webinar series in the past, we use the GoToWebinar uh, system, and here's some basic examples or descriptions of how you can utilize the system. We want today to be pretty interactive. Um, a lot of times we talk and people ask questions, but we're going to throw in some quizzes today where you're going to have the ability to type in your answers from the keyboard, um, or if you're participating in a group, you can answer for your group. Um, we also just want to um, have some more dialogue. Um, we've looked at the people that are participating in this webinar, and we have some amazing providers and county board staff on the webinar, and you guys are the experts, truly. You're the ones kind of feet on the ground doing the work, working directly with individuals with developmental disabilities, and so you're our greatest resource. And, you know, we'll provide you a couple tips throughout today, and we want to make sure that you walk away getting something from this hour, but we think it'll be more beneficial if we all participate. So, so moving on, just a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, for those that actively participate in today's webinar, you'll get one hour of continuing professional development, and that will be emailed to you in the way of a certificate um, within 30 days of today's seminar or webinar. So if you do you haven't received it within 30 days, please check your junk or your spam email. It, they seem to tend to go in those folders, and we want to make sure that you get that. Um, but if you haven't received uh, anything from our office within 30 days, please follow up with an email or uh, a phone call to us. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, um, you can also type them into the, the question or the chat box and we'll be happy to respond as time allows. If you have any questions about the system itself, it's probably better for you to call our office at this number provided at 614-995-3810, and Roxanne typically can assist or Deb. Now, um, one thing that we've found out is from time to time, people will experience some issues with the audio uh, for whatever reason, and if that's the case, please um, go ahead and maybe disconnect the call and then um, go ahead and call the number back in. That seems, to, for whatever reason, to, to fix that issue. So um, I think that is it for the basic housekeeping items. As far as what we want you to walk away with today is we really want you to have um, a good understanding of what's expected um, your requirements for analysis, and we want to give you some tools to do that. Just very simply, we want to share some information with you so you know what's expected. Uh, one of the things that we did in preparation for this webinar was we wanted to kind of look and see what the definition for analysis was. And, it's, and the reason we did that is we often have times where providers seem really kind of overwhelmed with this requirement, right, Andy? People are like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do an analysis. What's that mean? Um, I guess the whole point of this is you've got this. You guys do this every day. It's really just an assessment. Um, you're kind of separating stuff into components. So when I look at, when I think about it, it's like when you, when you break down things to kind of make more sense of them, 
Um, so, for example, when you're doing an analysis, you might break it into a couple different components or multiple ones. It could be by the individuals you serve, so how many MUIs does Andy have? It could be how many MUIs occurred in this one program. It could be, you know, how many falls or specific MUI categories did we have for our agency and kind of what the results were. So while that it may seem like a daunting ta task, it really isn't. You guys do this every day in your work. You problem solve, you kind of look into what's going on to better understand and draw some conclusions. So um, we just want to make sure that you understand um, this is really not a difficult process. It's really about having some conversations with team members, about talking about what's going on with individuals. And that's what you guys do. That's you know, as advocates and as care providers, that's what you do best. So that's, that's what we're asking in this analysis is really to look for information. Um, and then really what's the purpose of it? Um, you know, sometimes we'll hear stuff like, oh, those clowns at the state want us to do some kind of this or that requirement. And I, we don't know why people think that. I mean, why would anyone think we're clowns? We have no idea. But that's really not what this is about. The uh, kind of requirement for the analysis is really a process. It's about prevention. It's about um, making sure that individuals we serve have the best outcomes. And in doing so, I think we can also prevent injury and risk, not only to the individuals we serve, but to our staff. And that's really critical. I mean, if you have a person that's falling, falling and then needs more assistance getting around, um, that's going to obviously be more physically burdensome on your staff. And so we want to look at all these things so we can look at uh, preventing things from reoccurring, especially when you consider things like unscheduled hospitalizations, maybe law enforcement. So it's really any of these MUIs that we're really looking at preventing. And so, um, you know, it's not just about the requirement to do that, although it is required in rule, and we've provided the rule site here for you, it really is about prevention. And that's really what our whole system is about. It's dependent on really good providers of service, uh, properly reporting things in a timely manner, ensuring immediate actions for our individuals, and then um, through really good investigations, coming up with causing determining factors. And the whole basis for this system is really to provide a better quality of life uh, for the individuals that we serve. So um, it's really all about that. In terms of the rule requirements, um, we actually gave you the rule language in here. And we're not going to go over all of this. Um, but just to say that all providers of service are required to do semi-annual and annual analysis. Um, independent providers, county board run programs, agency providers. Anyone else, Andy? Anyone you can think of, pretty much. Yeah, anybody who provides services. Yes. And um, the semi-annual review is based on the first half of the year, which is January 1st through June 30th. So obviously we have that coming up soon. And then the, the annual, which is due in February to the county boards, is uh, for the, the whole year-long span. For um, last year, it would have been for 2015, and it's a three-year comparison. And we'll go through more in depth those um, different slides or requirements. Um, one of the things that we want to talk about is what's required for the analysis. Um, again, we pulled this information straight out of the rule language. And basically, it is that um, all providers are required to do these reviews. You have to include the date, the person completing the review, the time period. So if it's semi-annual, you're going to do that six months. If it's annual, you're going to do the year. And then a comparison of the data for the previous three years. Um, an explanation of the data. And then the, the MUI categories. Um, and then here's kind of our rule of thumb. Five MUIs 
in a six-month period, which are same or similar, and then 10 in a year-long period. And then you're going to look at trends across, you know, different homes, across different regions. Maybe, maybe I'm a large agency and I provide services in 30 counties. Maybe, maybe there's a trend noted in Scioto County, or maybe there's something in a region that seems to stand out to us. So we're going to look at those kind of trends. And um, we're also going to look at action plans that have uh, been put into place. I think when a COG plays a role in this analysis, you can look across those, you know, multiple county trends. Um, I have heard of some, you know, COGS identifying issues that they've identified with all the counties in their COG as they identify issues with a county or two that they serve. Yeah, and that's really that's really what it's about. It's it's not really about the numbers and the data. It's about you know what we do with that information. Um, I was talking with a county board who noticed a uh, pattern of unscheduled hospitalizations for pneumonia. And um, that is one of, um, it's a pretty risky um, illness for individuals with developmental disabilities and tends to be one of the highest reasons for causes of death for people that we serve. And this county happened to notice that it was little kiddos being served with their families. You know, so mom and dad or grandma, whomever, family members taking care of them, but we were noticing um, that um, the kids were getting sick for pneumonia. And so what the county board decided to do in that case was they wanted to get out information to the families to break down any barriers. So they said, you know, what if, what if mom and dad aren't getting this or family isn't getting this um, vaccine for this little child because there's a financial barrier. And so this county board put out a bunch of information about where you can get free pneumonia vaccines. Um, they made a point of talking about if you're getting any kind of Medicaid, Medicare, you know, what your coverage is for those. Um, they even listed places that would have free uh, pneumonia vaccines and then really talked about the importance of it. So it's real important, you know, what you do with this information um, to make sure that you're you're following up and um, putting in really good prevention plans. Okay, we are moving on. Again, we're not going to go through this word for word because you can certainly read it yourself. But um, like we said, it's required for county board uh, programs. And again, the, um, the emphasis is on those semi-annual and annual um, requirements for the analysis twice a year. And it's the five MUIs in six months and 10 in a year. And then it has the due dates, which if it's a county board operated program, it's the same as if a provider was, of service was doing it. And your um, requirements would be due August 31st for your semi-annual, which for all of us, that's going to be coming up soon. And in the annual, it's due the following um, February on the 28th for the previous year. So like I said, the county board's requirements for the county board operated programs and for the providers, whether it's an agency independent, um, they're the same in terms of the reporting periods for the analysis and also the due dates. Um, so that is that. Now, um, things that we talk about a lot in our system is just making people that we're served in are really um, having their needs taken care of. And so if there's an assessed need, um, and sometimes we see that in the way of an MUI trend, that we want to make sure those are addressed in the individual service plan. Um, that is a requirement of the MUI rule. Um, there's a similar verbiage in the SSA rule um, for service planning. So let's, let's make sure if there's identified as a concern or there's an MUI trend that the whole team is aware of it and that it's somehow addressed in the plan how we're going to um, assist that person and support them with whatever that may be. Um, it's just real important that we have those open lines of communication. And it's extremely important when we're talking about health and safety issues. Um, 
So in addition to the county board um, reviewing the providers um, analysis, we also have different requirements in the state. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have two uh, regional managers that do intake and they process every new MUI coming into the state of Ohio. Um, and it can range anywhere from 60 to 140 in a day, depending on what day it is or if there was a holiday or, or whatever. And so what our intake managers do is they process it to make sure immediate actions are happening. And they also want to make sure that there's no pattern or trend for that individual. So if, if they come across an individual who had three hospitalizations recently, they're going to flag that person, let the regional manager know, so that we can ensure that their team is addressing that. Then obviously we, another way that we um, process patterns and trends is making sure that information is an ISP like we talked about. And then we also have a nickel and dime reporting requirement um, that we look at from the statewide level. And it's really fascinating. I mean, I may be the only data geek out there, but um, when you look at some of the comprehensive data we have, it's kind of mind-blowing. Um, we can tell how many people have had five or more MUIs in a six-month period. And last year, or yeah, well, in the last part of last year, so let's say July 1st through December 31st, we had uh, 70, we had 185 people, excuse me, 185 people with five or more um, MUIs. That's why we call it nickel, because we're very clever at the state. I don't know if you realize that. And then the dime would be, of course, 10 or more MUIs in um, the annual pe reporting period. And we actually had 73 individuals across the state. So what we do with that information is we look closely to make sure that those people are being served. Um, sometimes the person may have very few supports, or maybe they're refusing supports. Um, Many times, I would say the majority of the time, everyone is trying their best, and it's just been very challenging to find the right level of supports that that person may need or may accept. Um, so it's just another kind of process that we look at through that information. Uh, we also have a mortality review board that meets quarterly. We look at all the aggregate data for the state of Ohio in terms of deaths. We look at all the different causes of death how our deaths of individuals with developmental disabilities compare to what we might call the typically um, developing uh, population. Um, we find that our individuals are living longer than ever before, and it's because of the good care they're getting and also the good preventative medical screenings they're getting. Um, another way that we utilize this information for patterns and trends is we have a stakeholder group um, that meets uh, twice a year through the state, and we look at every single MUI category. We look at um, different ways to kind of slice and dice the information. And so just like a provider would look at their information to analyze it, and a county board would do the same for their programs, we look at the whole state. So we're kind of looking at the big picture where you guys are looking at, you know, your communities or the counties that you might serve in. And so it's just another way to ensure that we're looking at all that information. All right. Everyone get your fingers on your keyboards, if you will. Um, we are going to have a quiz. So the quiz. I'll read it to you. Um, if you could type in your answers, A, B, C, or D is fine. Who is required to, whoa, we got some smarties in the audience. Uh-oh. You need I, to finish the question. <laughs> I, I saw a couple wrong answers there. Who is required to complete semi-annual and annual MUI analysis? Look at these overachievers. All right. Um, independent providers, agency providers, county board programs. Now, that would be embarrassing if one of the regional managers got that wrong, right? It would be. <laughs> but they didn't. I'm just kidding. Um, and the answer is D, all of the above. 
So excellent job out of all of you. I only saw one wrong answer. And we won't call that person out. I'm sure they just... I'm sure they don't work for the department. No. <laughs> they might have fat fingers like me and kind of mis-typed. Uh, so thank you very much for participating. Um, the next quiz question is, what is the point of doing all of this analysis? Is it prevention, A, B, the clowns in the MUI office? Answer very carefully. C, I was looking for something to do. Um, D, none of, none of the above. All right. Uh, we, we think it's uh, kind of funny, but important to realize that there, is, there really is a purpose to this. It's not just about having another requirement. It's about, uh, it's about really looking at the prevention, what outcomes we can um, kind of help individuals uh, with if, if they need more support. So that's kind of the whole purpose of what we're doing. And now Andy is going to get into the specifics of what, um, what we do with the requirements and um, give you a little more guidance on that information. If anyone has any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to, um, to type those in, and we will get to them as soon as possible. Um, I do a lot of work um, with county boards, and um, some questions come also from provider agencies who contact us on a regular basis. Um, when you're starting to do an analysis, what you want to look at first is where you started. The requirement for the analysis is a three-year analysis. Um, so we want to start by looking at where we began. Okay. So you review the previous information that you have from your analysis before, any trends that you've identified, any patterns you've identified. Um, what did you address? Um, what did you do to address that particular um, trend or pattern? Did it work? Uh, what was the outcome? Um, it could be that the interventions that you did work very well, and it's no longer an issue for that individual, that program, or that county board. But there are cases where things are complex, individuals are complex, and we may have tried something that didn't work or worked marginally, and we need to take a different approach. So we want to know where we started. We want to know were there concerns that we had during our last analysis um, that we still need to discuss, and, and I kind of look at that as the old business part of the analysis. Okay, where do we leave off? Um, you know, it, the last time we sat down and, and this, did this particular function. Okay, um, there are some instances where county boards have told providers that you don't have um, you don't have to do an analysis if you didn't have any MUIs for um, the semi-annual period or the annual period. Um, and that isn't really a um, piece of advice that, that's beneficial to the providers. Um, I think this sometimes happens when the county board's trying to be helpful to a provider and say, you know, I, you know, you don't have to go through this function um, because you didn't have anything to really look at. Um, but it's a three-year requirement. Um, and so you're saying just because I didn't have anything for the first six months this year doesn't mean I didn't have anything previously. Correct. Okay. Um, and it, it, it gets to, a, um, we want to make sure that we're, there's also the, the piece to it that, that it's a rule requirement. So even if a county board were to say to a provider, you know, you don't need to send that in, um, they're going to have reviews by OPSR who are going to come out and do, you know, reviews for um, certification or, or licensure, depending upon which is true for the provider. And they're going to look for these things. They're going to look to make sure these rule requirements are done. Um, so there's been some communication in the field that um, can be, I think, unintentionally misleading to a provider. Um, I think the, the county boards who have told these um, providers this are well-meaning. Um, I think they're trying to maybe lessen the burden on the provider. But um, we also don't want to make sure that we, we set someone up on the other end that you know, they don't meet their obligations and then there's some sort of consequence for them because they're following what they think is good advice. Right. And, and even though they may have no MUIs in a year, that information still needs to be reviewed as the process or those three years right. because maybe that says something in itself. Right. I know that when Scott and I do training sometimes, um, we, we tell providers MUIs are not necessarily bad things. And so we want people to, to think about that 
um, just because you have MUIs reported and you see a pattern and trend, to us, that's, hey, I've identified this, I'm working with the team on this, that's a positive thing. Whereas, you know, if I see a provider that serves 100 people and they go three years without having an MUI filed, it makes, it, it might be an indicator of something else. So uh, we actually have a question from the audience. Uh, we have a couple, but only one that we can read out loud. Okay. And the first, this one is, if a provider has no MUIs during the entire three-year period, do they still need to complete the analysis? And the answer is yes. Um, you need to show some documentation that you have reviewed. Um, you, you have completed these reviews. It's required by the rule. Um, and there are a lot of, and a lot of small, we get this question from a lot of smaller providers, you know, independent providers, you know, small agency providers. So I really haven't had a lot of MUIs. I have folks who really haven't generated them. Um, do I need to do this? And you, and you need, because it's a rule requirement, you need to show some documentation that you've done this. It may not take you as long, obviously, because there's not a whole lot to look at. Um, but when a reviewer comes around and to, to see if you've met this requirement, you need to show, if you don't have any information, then how does the reviewer know that you completed the task? That you, that you did the rule requirement. Um, so we don't want to set a provider up to face some sort of sanction um, because they don't understand that the activity is required and you have to have some documentation of it even if there are no MUIs. And it's really about the process and prevention. So we know that people are required whether they have MUIs for that time period, that review period. What about are they required to send it into the county board? Because that's also a rule requirement. It is a rule requirement. And, they sh and the advice we have to give those providers is, yes, it's a rule requirement. You need to send it in. Now, occasionally, um, you know, they'll, they'll be directed another way by a county board. And I don't know if we can really say that's OK because of the rule requirement that they do send it in. So they should make it a habit of just routinely completing the task, routinely set, sending it to the county board. Um, so you can show that you've met all your obligations, that you, you are taking um, these actions seriously. Um, and that you're doing what you can to help the individuals that you serve, you know, through these requirements. And sometimes I know it seems tedious and silly. Okay, we didn't have anything. Why are we doing this? But you do have to show that you did complete the action. Um, about the process, about again. The process, yes. And there, we're going to show you five different um, examples of analysis. And one of them is that was provided by the Cuyahoga County Board a couple years ago is super easy. And um, so we, as we go through those, we will tell you which ones we think, hey, if you're a small provider or you serve very few people, you know, this is the one for you if you want to if you want to use one. So we'll go through that. Right. And then it's important that as you do it, if you're doing your semi-annual, it's a three-year comparison. So if you're doing your semi-annual um, January to June for 2016, you're comparing that to the same period for 15 and the same period for 14, the same way you would compare 2016 annual data to the annual data for 2015 and 2014. So you want to make sure you get all three of those years and then you're comparing them to the same thing. Um, all right, so we're going to also, in addition to um, doing kind of the um, old business, we're looking at the new issues as well. So we want to make sure that when we need to address a particular trend, we want to make sure that um, the trend is identified clearly, that um, we clearly identify what we're going to action we're going to take and then who's responsible for taking that action and making sure that it took place. So we want to make sure that we have a plan, that everybody knows what the plan is on the team, we're going to implement it. And then we're going to go check back and see with the person who's responsible for making sure it took place, what was the outcome? Um, so we want to, and that's the same way, you know, we looked at old trends and we took that approach, but it gives us the ability to compare what we did, um, that judge its effectiveness, and then come up with a new plan if needed. So it's, it's showing that progression of our attempts to address the particular issue. Um, it's sort of like that old business, new business approach to, um, to, to um, meetings. That's really good. And you know, um, thinking back, um, you know, whether you're working for a county board or a provider, we've all kind of had our different uh, roles throughout the years. 
Um, I can remember um, being in team meetings where we've talked about trends, um, maybe not even using the words patterns of trends, but we talked about, you know, some challenges people had. And um, I remember, you know, being with the social worker and the speech pathologist and um, some administrative staff, but um, the best, the best, um, information and suggestions often came from the direct care professionals that work with the individuals closely because they know what's going to work. I mean, you can sit kind of in your desk and say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But if it's not meaningful and it's not going to work for that individual, then basically it's just a waste of everyone's time. So make sure the right people are at the table to, to help you know, the individual themselves as well, making sure that the right people at the table to discuss this and come up with the best support. Now, the other, um, the other question we get asked is, what is a trend? And the department guidance is um, five of the same or similar MUIs in a six-month period or, ten, or ten in a year or anything that the team feels is a, a pattern or trend for that person. Don't get too caught up in the numbers. Uh, this is guidance. It is not something that should be looked at as like set in stone. If it's not five, it's not a trend. If it's not ten, it's not a trend. It can be a significant trend with three for an individual or a significant trend in a year for six or seven. I mean, it, so don't get too caught up in the numbers. Um, we have situations where people have incidents of neglect, abuse, and misappropriation. You know, those types of trends, we really want to have it happen ten times before we consider it a trend. Well, absolutely not. Do we want to have it happen, you know, three, four, five times before we consider it a trend in a six-month period? No, we want to address it as quickly as we can. Um, so don't get too caught up in the numbers. If it's significant enough, um, then we need to act on it and even identify it as a trend, even though it's not exactly five or not exactly ten. Um, so we don't want to get too caught up in that. That's guidance. That doesn't mean that you can't identify other, other situations as trend. We want to make sure that in the end we're working to reduce the risk of harm to the individual and anything that we can do to address that, even if it only happens six times in a year, if it's significant enough, we really need to be addressing it as a trend. Right. And who's going to know better what, um, what's going on with that person than the people that work directly with them, such as yourself? Right. All right. So now we're going to test your knowledge. Um, everyone get ready to answer. What? Give us one example, maybe something you've seen where your team may identify a pattern or trend that maybe doesn't fit into that five and a six or ten and a uh, year long criteria. So, oh, a little less to quickly to respond this time. I think we might have stumped them. If it's not multiple choice, the answers are probably longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, falls, excellent. Um, choking, thank you, Beth. That is. Totally, absolutely correct. Some peer-to-peer -peer issues. Um, unscheduled hospitalizations. You guys got this. Um, so I, I like that we're talking about falls, unscheduled hospitalizations, and choking, and maybe medication issues that you know have a risk to health and safety. Um, because oh, law enforcement, another really good one. Those are significant enough. That, like Andy said, we don't want to wait until there's, you know, five of those. Um, and so those are really good things that the team may say, okay, we've seen one, we've seen two, let's get together and problem solve. So um, really good answers. Excellent. Um, we do have a couple um, questions before we move on, and so I'm going to Go back a little bit. Oh, the other one, suicide attempt. Very good answer. Um, and we know that when people attempt suicide, it really is a cry for help. So you have to take those all very seriously. Um, so our question, Andy, from the audience is, who do we send the semi-annual and annual analysis to? Well, if you are a provider, you're going to send it to the county board. Who in the county board? Um, whoever the county board is designated to receive it. Okay. I mean, typically, it's, it's a person involved with the MUI unit in some way, shape, or form. Or it, it's not a unit, a person. Yeah. Um, maybe the MUI contact. Um, it, it depends on the particular county who you would send it to, so it's important to know who that is. 
Um, and of course, if it's for county board programming, it comes to the state. So, excellent. Um, let's see, we have another question. What if you are listed um, as a certified provider, but you don't currently serve anyone, and maybe you haven't for that analysis period? Do you need to complete an analysis? No, I would just simply document not providing services and include the time period. Um, and I think that would be sufficient. So um, I think we're going to head on, move on to the next slide. Since there's no more questions right now. All right. So how do we identify trends and patterns? Well, what we want to look for are, sorry, things that repeat is, is probably the simplest way to put it. So are they happening at similar locations or at similar times? Um, are the incidents caused by the same or similar actions? Are there repeat incidents for the particular individual or group of individuals? Um, are there common repeated problems that you're noticing through the MUI process um, is in regards to reporting time frames, investigations, that sort of thing? Uh, are your numbers going up or down, or is there a lack of numbers altogether? Um, just because there's no numbers there doesn't mean that there aren't issues. Um, you know, there's some there's some wild swings that can happen occasionally with these um, analysis, which tend to happen more in your medium to smaller size counties where a, a problem with a few folks, um, whether it be individual related, provider related, whatever, can skew your numbers for a year or two um, as you're trying to address situations. Um, it's a little bit harder with the bigger counties to do that um, just because there are so many incidents and so many individuals. But in a medium sized to smaller county, you sort of have an advantage in the fact that you can sort of identify those swings a little bit easier than a big county. Um, they're going to show themselves a little more readily. There recently was a, um, uh, a county board that I work with who um, in this process was going through and started looking at incidents and they started to, started to look at um, some known injuries but they found out they were happening in similar locations at times and it was on their playground at their school. And they started then breaking down, once they saw the number of incidents happening, they were breaking down as to why these were occurring. And they went through and they identified that appropriate footwear on the playground wasn't something that was really required. So there were a lot of kids wearing flip-flops and sandals and things like that, which were causing them to fall. And they were getting injured to the point where it met the definition of a known injury. Um, so then they went back and they made some changes to um, their programs, their requirements. So all kids had to wear appropriate shoes, you know, sneakers and stuff like that on the playground. And those incidents, for the most part, went away. Obviously, there's occasional child falling and tripping and things like that. But it went down greatly. So, I mean, even the little known injury types of things, categories, which sometimes don't seem quite as important, you can identify and prevent incidents, injuries to kids and things like that, in this case, um, by, by doing the analysis. Excellent um, example. All right. Um, some other things to look at for trends. Um, some things that we've noticed. Occasionally, um, you'll see the same staff involved in, in incidents of unapproved behavior support, which could be an indicator of control issues. I, I do know of a couple instances where um, whether it's a staff person's been with an individual for a little bit too long, maybe they're burnt out a little bit, um, or maybe you know um, they haven't worked with them actually for very long or don't have a lot of experience and they're trying to trying to make things happen the way that they think that they should, which could be an indication of you know, a control issue that's causing the behavior. And I have known a couple of situations where by removing the staff and putting a new staff in, um, it's actually caused that trend to, to go away um, because that, re that relationship, for whatever reason, was, was difficult and challenging. Um, multiple neglects agency-wide due to staff scheduling errors. We, we see these um, actually far too commonly. Um, and it can be an indication of um, difficulty at a provider level, typically maybe in the scheduling or administration area that needs to be addressed. Um, gets into more of a systematic kind of issue. Um, choking incidents due to continually be given the wrong diet texture. And this one I think for us is of particular importance because we are, with these choking incidents, they do pose a significant risk to the individuals. 
So if there's an issue where a provider is not preparing food correctly, I mean, it really poses a significant risk. So we need to make sure we address those as quickly as we can. And that just doesn't have to be just for one individual. You can see it across spectrum, either at a one site or multiple sites for a provider if they're not really um, addressing these particular issues um, correctly. Um, and then, of course, um, the falls related to environmental hazards, such as a throw rug in the hallway, um, you know, falls in the bathroom if maybe there aren't proper precautions in terms of um, maybe, you know, those uh, non-slip things in the bathtub or, you know, proper grab bars if the individual needs that sort of assistance. Um, you know, it's different, different um, things that you put in place to address those environmental issues. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, if it's a systematic issue, say such as individuals maybe leaving the hospital or leaving um, medical appointments and then there being problems with getting maybe medication started up or follow-up appointments, you know, occurring as they should. Those are also things we need to be looking for and trying to address because they're systematic issues, not just related to particular individuals, but a provider could be having along the way. Mm -hmm. The provider can either self-identify or the county board can identify that might prevent future incidents that pose risk to individuals. So it really is important. Uh, we had a question, and the question was, when we say five same or similar, is it the, or six, or I'm sorry, yeah five same or similar or ten in a year, um, is it at the provider's discretion to identify what that pattern trend is? Well, I, you know, I, it, it, to be honest, it's really at the discretion of, you have, you have the provider analysis and the county board also doing analysis, and the county board looking over the provider analysis. Um, there is some discretion. Um, I think that you have to err on the side of caution, however. Um, if the, the more significant the, the number of incidents, well, the more significant the type of incident, the risk it poses to the individual, you probably want to err on the side of caution. Um, I, you know, we always sort of say here to county boards, you know, if, if you don't know, um, like in terms of filing an MEI, if you don't know, err on the side of caution. I would do the same thing here. If you don't know, err on the side of caution. Just consider it a trend if you're not sure. Um, you know, it, it's always better, no provider or county board has ever gotten in any sort of hot water with us for acting early. Um, you know, no, no one's ever suffered from early prevention. Um, so, yeah, there is some discretion, um, and, but you need to look at the particulars of the incident. When we do these trainings, we talk in general a lot, um, but when you, when you actually functionally do it, you're looking at your specific situations you have a little bit better feel for those situations. But again, if you're not sure, err on the side of caution. Always err on the side of, of taking action versus not. Okay. Um, um, we had another question, and I can field this one. The question is, is a provider required to look back three years in addition to the current year? And it's actually a three-year analysis. So if, I'm, if 2015 was the year that I was looking at, then I would also look at 2014 and 2013. Right. So, But if you wish to go an extra year, we will not complain. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Always, okay. Also, please remember, um, again, we've talked a little bit about the fact that if the board instructs you not to send it in, still do it. Um, it is a requirement. I would hate for any provider to get cited because they didn't do it because of um, kind of bad advice. Um, the other thing that, um, the other really helpful place to go is the health and safety toolkit on our website. Um, for those, I've had, uh, particularly this has been very helpful um, to small providers who maybe are getting into the business or they're kind of new to some of these requirements. The health and safety toolkit has a wealth of information. I have one dear provider who called me and called it a gold mine because all of her questions were, were you know, all, there's so much there for her to use. Um, so as you're, if you're a county board guiding a provider um, or if you're a provider listening to this webinar and you, and you um, have questions after we're done and you're looking for resources, there's a lot in there. Um, not only how to do it um, in terms of the requirements, but how to do it, examples of how to do it and then also, for example, forms. So there's, there's a lot there, not just for this, but for unusual incidents and other requirements. Um, and I'd like to um, 
shout out to the different counties and providers because many of these good resources have been provided by all of you, and we welcome any more. Um, you know, we have a requirement to do something, but there's a million different ways that you can do it. And so as we go through the, the examples, you'll see there's some very simple, there may be some more complex ways to do it. It's really what fits best into your needs um, while still meeting the rule requirements. And then also the county boards are available to help providers as well if they have, if they have questions. Um, okay. I'm sorry, I got lost on my slides here, I apologize. Um, so tips for a good analysis, um, include the MUIs to occur during the times that you are responsible for serving the individual. Um, discover the MUI or if you provided around the clock care. If you look at the rule, it gives you um, examples of when things should be filed and, and, and um, according to what kind of provider you are. Um, so an example that we, we provide during the training here is that if um, something happens to Johnny, he comes home from work and he states a peer hit him at work and you're the residential provider, you wouldn't include that necessarily in your um, analysis unless, of course, um, you're an ICFDD or a foster provider. Okay. Or you could be a certified provider care, providing 24-7. Yep. Okay. Um, other tips for good analysis. Um, you want to make sure you include the cause and contributing factors. Um, you really want to get to why. I mean, the cause and contributing factors are really the why did this happen? Um, you know, what is it? How far can you break it down? Um, because we do have situations where, kind of in the, in the example on the slide, where um, you know some some individuals have trends that sort of bubble up due to due to circumstances in their life, like somebody passing away, losing a favorite staff medication change, moving out of the family home. Um, you know, these types of things, you know, might, uh, you know, things like done from behavior source might increase or might occur where they didn't occur before because the individual is adjusting. And hopefully if the individual gets the support that they need that those things will settle back down. Um, in your addressing the patterns and trends in terms of prevention, um, try to avoid vagueness. Um, you know, to say that we're going to monitor really doesn't show an action. I mean, it really doesn't show that you're taking some sort of planful step towards addressing the particular issue. There, there are occasions when just monitoring a situation with some thought um, you know, is appropriate, but in most cases when you're talking about trends and patterns that meet this level, it's really not. Um, so you want to be specific as to how, what your plan is and how you're going to address it, make sure your staff are trained, um, and you really, as a, as a team, provider, county board, want to want to evaluate the effectiveness of what you're doing on an ongoing basis. You don't have to wait six months for the next analysis to do that. Right. Teams should be doing that all along. Um, and you want to make sure that just staff reminders are not necessarily just the only thing that's done as a prevention as well. Right. Um, you know. Some of the best um, kind of patterns and trends, you know, analysis things I've seen, um, there was and, and I say that sarcastically, <laughs> one of the um, individuals was being targeted by their roommate in a large ICF. And it was, it was daily, and it was, it was very disruptive to that individual. I mean, it impacted her quality of life. She was getting kicked in the stomach by this gentleman who was much larger. And, you know, to say we'll continue to monitor, I, I didn't really see anything good coming from that. Really need to make sure that you know, we're not minimizing what's occurring. If someone's, you know, the victim of a peer-to-peer -peer act, uh, physical act especially, you know, that that really um, impacts them. We need to make sure we're addressing it. Um, and likewise, sometimes we'll see unintentionally where it seems like, you know, we're, um, we're maybe placing blame on the person. Like, if Andy fell and I'd be like, well, I reminded him not to be so clumsy the next time or, you know, like in my house where my husband's shoes are size 12 and he leaves them sitting around and I trip over them, he'll be like, hey, careful. It's like, oh my gosh, why don't you move your shoes so, you know, people don't trip over those boats. That's what we say in our family. Anyway. Um, so we we want to be certain, you know, there, there might be situations where such as with the choking where there do need to be verbal reminders by staff, but then you want to make sure there's training 
um, that the staff fully understand what their roles are, where they're to be at, how the food's to be prepared. There are other elements to it than just a verbal reminder. Exactly. So, yeah, we're not saying that you can't do those. We're just saying that it should be a thought-out approach and, you know, just saying, hey, be careful. It's probably not going to be a great way to assess the situation and see if there's a reason why that person's falling. And as you can see, we usually key in in falls and choking because, um, well, falls are the, the largest number of significant injuries in our, in our system. Um, and also, um, falls and choking deaths are extremely preventable. Um, I'm not going to read through this whole slide, but I think this gives you an example of um, things that you can look at as a team, you know, or an example. You know, don't just say, be careful. Hey, let's really look at what the pattern is. Um, when the person's falling, what, what kind of shoes are they wearing? Has there been a recent medication change that might um, may be contributing to that person. Has a fall assessment been completed? Um, there are really good resources on our health and safety toolkit, um, choking webinars and also falls webinars. We had a provider also um, give us falls and choking assessments and allowed us to post those on our websites. So there's a lot of things on there that include tools and resources and also use each other, I think. Um, as providers and county board staff, you guys are the best resources and experts. Um, so you may have experienced something with the individuals you serve that might be helpful to another provider agency. All right. We, <laughs> we already have some answers. So when a semi-annual and annual analysis is due to the county board, and the answer is B. It's August 31st and February 28th. So I think everyone's getting that right. Excellent. Um, so again, that's the requirement straight out of the rule um, if you want to look and, and reference it. We also in our toolkit have um, examples of the analysis that we're going to be going over um, next. And we also have like what our um, MUI rule requirements for independent providers, MUI requirements for agency providers that step out. Hey, you know, I have to do an analysis for the MUIs this time of the year. I have to do monthly UI logs to look for patterns and trends of that. So another great resource is kind of like a cheat sheet. Um, we're trying to make this, you know, we know it's a complicated system, but we want to um, provide as many resources as we can. Um, so we're going to quickly go over these different five examples and um, know that these are available to you on our website. Um, the first one is a semi-annual annual agency analysis. This is a perfect example. If you are a small agency uh, who doesn't serve many people, maybe operates in one county, or maybe, um, what was I going to say, um, doesn't have very many MUIs, you can just fill this out paper and you can actually get it in the Word document, type it in, your name, what the review period is, how many MUIs you had, and it goes through kind of the numbers of MUIs, so you're comparing apples to apples here. And then, um, then you basically do your just analysis here. And it shows you, so you can see if there's a spike in misappropriations, you can see if there's a spike in verbal abuse, or you can say, hey, let's celebrate this. You know, we had um, maybe no misappropriations last year, where the previous year we had 10. And, and why do we think that is? Why, why were, were we so successful? Um, so it's also a way to, to look at staff's um, great actions and um, celebrate those things. Um, again, once you go through the data, you're going to have to um, describe the requirements that Andy has gone over, looking at any trends, looking at um, actions and preventative measures and whether they were effective or not. So again, all these things that Andy talked about are right here in this little form for you. And it works perfectly. You can do it, you know, do it. And if you don't have any MUIs, you can document that really easily on this form. And um, provide it to the county board and also uh, keep it for your requirements. But still don't get too stuck on the 
five and six months or ten and twelve. If it's significant enough, you don't you can still include those people on the form, even though the form has five and six or ten and twelve. So don't get too stuck on that. This is the same exact um, analysis, except for it's for an independent provider. So um, again, this form is available to you on our website. We're not going to go over um, this form because again, it is the same thing that we saw. Um, I do want to stress that if you are an independent provider serving in multiple counties, let's say Andy's a provider, he serves in Franklin and Fairfield, he needs to complete an analysis for Franklin and one for Fairfield. You can't lump them all in together, so you have to do one um, analysis for each county that you operate in. Um, another example we want to show you is, and we have examples of this on our, on our forms section of um, the health and safety toolkit as well, and it's basically just, um, it gives you an example of how they're reviewing the different MUIs, breaking it down by different program areas. Um, um, we had a question, so just quickly I want to clarify. If you are an agency provider and you operate in multiple counties, let's say I'm, you know, ABC company and I operate in 20 counties, each county um, that you operate, you're required to do an analysis for that county board based on the individuals that are served through that county. Um, it would also behoove you to also do a large agency-wide um, analysis just for your own self. Um, but it is a requirement for both independents and agencies to provide an analysis for each county that you serve in. Um, so again, this is just another example. It shows you the different, um, how this county board program addressed the different MUIs that were filed. Um, and you can see here just in the different 19 categories that were reviewed. Um, and then you can see kind of the difference in um, year to year. The fourth analysis that we're going to look at here's, um, let's see, is, is a very um, simple analysis, kind of like the first form that we looked at. Um, it's a good one if you, again, are a small agency or um, you have your own data collection. You might just want to, it's something that you can do um, very easily, you know, in a Word document. And, and if you go to, we have a link later, what's called our analysis guiding document. It just has all these um, different headers in a form for you, and you can just complete the information um, that makes sense for you. You know, your data review, who did your review. We find that when the more people are involved in the reviews, the more comprehensive they are. Um, the more disciplines, you tend to get eyes on different disciplines. You tend to get a more thorough, more comprehensive sort of review. The quality is a little bit better. Um, Absolutely. So we, you know, get that nurse in there, social work, the provider, the, the county board, um, individuals, families, guardians. The more you get involved in that, um, the better the review tends to be. Different sets of eyes. Um, I wanted to stress again this example because I think it's really good. It's a large agency and they break down the provider by, I'm sorry, break down the MUIs by home. And so that's a really good way to see that, um, you know, if there's a pattern or trend with a specific um, home that it could be environmental, it could be staffing, it could be just the individuals that live there. But again, it's giving that consideration. Finally, we have the analysis for um, the independent or agency provider that's available to you in Data Warehouse. A great tool. It does all the counting for you, so you really, we want you to focus on the, the um, reviewing, the analysis part of it. Um, you're going to be comparing the same information that your county board has. Um, I would recommend this if you are a, an independent provider with a lot of MUIs or you serve multiple people or if you're a large agency that um, maybe operates in multiple counties, it really gives you a good, um, in, good information in terms of slicing and dicing the data on demographic information. There's three reports that you run. It takes less than five minutes to do them. Um, and then you spend your time focusing on what's important. What, what have you gained from that kind of assessment of the information? What do you plan to do with it? What did you do last time? Did it work? Those kind of things. 
Um, and then there's a link here on how to run those reports uh, through the data warehouse and a lot of other tools, in fact. Um, and we're going to wrap up with one more quiz. Uh, and the final question is, am I required to use one of these examples provided to do my analysis? Huh? Yes, thank you. Um, the answer is no, you're not. Um, as long as you meet the rule requirements, we don't care what you use. Um, you know, some providers are extremely savvy and have these complex data things that rival NASA and everything. That's cool. That's great. Um, if you don't have those things, please use one of our resources. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, do want to let you know that the county boards are required to follow up on their and document their reviews of providers' um, semi-annual and annual analysis. Here's the time frames that we've already talked about. Um, we're really excited. We're going to be um, publishing our um, July through December um, calendar uh, for training. We have a lot of MUI rule training and those kind of rule requirement trainings, but we also have a lot of training on health and safety topics. We're going to hit heroin abuse for individuals with developmental disabilities. We're going to hit some issues with transition. Um, you know, transitioning from home to hospital, those kind of things, uh, burns, falls, seizures, and just a lot of other topics, sexual assault for individuals with developmental disabilities. So we encourage you, we're going to send out a mass email to the providers and county boards once that is published, but we want to um, make sure you know you can always go to this link anytime to see what's available. And we would welcome your feedback on what you'd like to see in the future or if you'd like to participate in a webinar and be one of the speakers. Um, so that concludes our time for the webinar. Um, like we said, um, if we didn't have time to answer your questions, we will try to respond to those via email within the next week. Within 30 days, please expect to see your certificate of participation emailed to you. If you don't receive it after 30 days, check your, your junk email and then uh, contact our office. If you need assistance with any of the uh, resources or locating them, please don't hesitate to call us or your county board. We're here to support you. Um, we certainly value and appreciate the work that you do every day uh, supporting individuals with developmental disabilities and it's our job to support you. Um, so whatever you need, please give us a call. And um, I think that's it. And we will wrap up. Thank you very much.